You're listening to Ricky and Jimmy on Relationships, the show where we uncover the thoughts and behaviors that are sabotaging your relationship and what you can do about it. Jimmy and I are passionate about sharing the ways that imperfect partners like you and I can shift unhealthy relational dynamics and create closeness. So welcome, drop your defenses and open your heart, eyes, and ears. Let's learn how to be the best partner we can be together. Okay, welcome back everybody. Today we have such a special guest. Jimmy and I are thrilled to introduce Julie Manano. She's a licensed marriage and family therapist who specializes in emotionally focused therapy, um, which my audience might recognize is kind of the gold standard for dealing with attachment issues. Um, but even more exciting, Julie's got a new book coming out. Uh, so today we're going to be talking a lot about her new book, Secure Love, Create a Relationship That so Lasts a Lifetime. <laughs> and for the folks who can't see, Jimmy's holding yes. it up. He has a, an advanced oh, copy. Yeah. Very exciting. <laughs> Julie, thank you yeah. so much for talking to us today. Jimmy and I have been talking about your account as long as we have had a podcast. Wow. Well, I know you guys are both have been longtime supporters and I just really appreciate that. And I love how we're all working together here to get these messages out. And I appreciate you guys too. I was, uh, let me tell, tell you one quick story about, about, um, so obviously like you've, we've already established you're, you're one of the first accounts, um, that Ricky and I talked about once we, once we got introduced to each other. If we haven't mentioned it, your handle is at the secure relationship. We already mentioned that, right? Anyways, yeah. if you're not, and, if and you're not for the blue check, cause there are a lot of imposters. Oh my gosh. Yes. Sell yeah. psychic readings too. I'm, oh. I'm just now dealing with all yeah. the imposter accounts and it's very difficult to manage. I guess it's a good thing to <laughs> have a good problem to have. Um, yeah. But if you're not following her, please go follow her because her account is absolute gold. Yes. And the um, secure relationship for anyone who's navigating away from the podcast to find it right now. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So quick, quick, funny story. So you were one of the people that I was like, Ricky, we have got to try to get Julie on the show somehow. And so I reached out to your team and no offense to them or you, but like, I didn't hear back for a, a while. Maybe it was mm -hmm. like weeks and weeks went by and I was like, okay, so I'm just not, I'm not their cup of tea. I'm not, you know, like they got other Aww. things to do and which is fine. <laughs> like, you know, when you reach out to people that you look up to, you're, you're, there's going to be some people that are like, oh, that's, that's okay. Um, and so I essentially gave that up and then just randomly, uh, maybe one of your assistants reached out and, and they were like, oh yeah, like we'd love to do this. And so it was oh, such a, good. it was such a wonderful, I was like, oh my gosh, like the stars are aligning. And then, yeah. um, and then, <laughs> And then I got you, new, and then I got your new book, which is available uh, at the end of January. But it's, you can pre-order it now. You can pre-order it. Yeah, it's available everywhere. Um, you know, all over the world. I've checked all sorts of Amazons, and it is coming out in multiple languages. It has not been printed yet in multiple languages, but those deals are already done. So eventually, awesome. that, that will be the place. Yeah. Well, I absolutely, I absolutely loved it, and um, can't wait to. Um, recommend it on all my Great. all my other pages but anyways i'll let ricky <laughs> start I've, I've said enough um well julie uh i brought i brought some questions to this interview today i think um i think jimmy has some questions for you too and we um maybe we'll just start right in on that if that's how you'd like to uh -huh. just some general attachment and relationship questions unless you would like to dive immediately into the content of the book and who the book's for mm -hmm. I think whatever, you know, feels is best for your audience is, is okay. Great for me. Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, maybe, and we can do a little of both. Maybe we can ping pong back and forth yeah, on for those sure. topics. Um, sure. So uh, the number one question I had for you was um, my audience is mostly unmarried, maybe newer couples dealing with a push pull mm -hmm. dynamic. And what advice would you have for new couples who find themselves in that pursuing, running, mm -hmm. troublesome thing, and then they want to make it work, but they're not necessarily serious enough to, to head into couples counseling together? Do you have advice for couples like that? Sure. I do. I do. If, if, you know, I think that my advice is always once you kind of make that commitment to go forward, you know, on a permanent basis, then that's when you, it can be so valuable to go do, do a few sessions, maybe just five sessions of couples work. Um, if you mm -hmm. didn't grow up in a home where you were modeled or had experiences with healthy relationships, it's, it's almost like a, um, 
you know, I don't mandates kind of a strong word, but it will prevent, <laughs> your, you know, many, many sessions of couples work later. Um, but you're, you're asking like, Hey, we haven't made that commitment yet. So right. what I would do is learn your negative cycle, right? Every couple mm. has this negative cycle. Um, virtually every couple out there will have it, you know, um, unless you're already, you know, super securely attached, right? But if you can relate to any level of that insecurely attached dynamic, um, you know, it's going to show up in a negative cycle. If it doesn't show up in a negative cycle, it's not an insecure attachment, right? It, right. Because we're not just saying, hey, you know, you have an insecure attachment. We're saying, what's the cost of this insecure attachment? And the cost yeah. is how it shows up in these communication cycles that are going to be triggered by conflict. And Couples who aren't serious can easily have conflict and, mm -hmm. you know, how they manage that conflict is really ultimately going to determine the health of the relationship and the conflict can be surrounding their closeness. It can, you know, how much time they spend together, how much separateness they have. Um, it can, you know, their, their sex life. It can revolve around household chores and just kind of having a life together if that's relevant for them. Um, and it can just revolve around how they do conflict to begin with, you know. Um, so basically, if you can really use that opportunity in this closer relationship with another human as a way to understand better how your attachment insecurity is being triggered in real life, in real time, in real relationships, um, you're going to not only help that relationship thrive, and feel better, but you're also going to learn a tremendous amount about yourself. I love that. And that's what a great answer. Well, thank yeah. You. And I love that. Um, for in my own partnership, I had started really learning a lot about attachment theory um, at the beginning of this kind of very tumultuous, mm -hmm. tumultuous push pull relationship that I'd found myself in. We were not anywhere near a point where I was comfortable asking him to go to couples therapy, but I thought, yeah. Yeah. um, this is going to teach me a lot about my triggers and what, like, I love this person. Mm -hmm. I don't want to leave. What can I mm -hmm. learn from the kind of arguments and conflicts that we're getting in? And how can I, how can I practice showing up in a different way? Not to say that my partner was practiced, but I thought if this doesn't work, it's going to be a wonderful learning experience for me. And it Absolutely. turns out that I just, just my own practice with being more calm and, and, and getting mm -hmm. curious about his experience, all the wonderful things you talk about in your new book and on your Instagram account. I turned my push pull relationship around just by starting that work. That's amazing. That's mm -hmm. just amazing. And you talk about that a lot in the book. Um, <clears throat> I probably didn't write the quote down, but, um, you're one of the biggest accounts that I remember, uh, where you, really push the narrative that you changing in a positive direction is going to affect your relationship. So, mm -hmm. um, and, 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 and in a positive way, because like, you know, mm -hmm. any change that you make positive is going to affect the relationship. Mm -hmm. And, um, while I can understand, and you do talk in the book, like you, you have a great quote here, like closeness doesn't just happen. Closeness is earned through the way partners think and feel about each other and the way that we speak to each other and the ways that we mm -hmm. behave in this relationship. While that's also true, it's also true that we can positively affect the, 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 uh, the relationship just by changing ourselves and, and how we, mm -hmm. uh, how we self-reflect and how we're pursuing emotional maturity and, and learning about being vulnerable and learning about our triggers and all those things are, are so great. Um, that's what your, your, your account stood out immediately at, um, kind of like mm -hmm. understanding, understanding how important that is. Right. Yeah, I do. I do put a lot of focus on that. I think a lot of the material out there and I appreciate, you know, that you guys seem to have that mindset also, which mm -hmm. is that, you know, there's a lot of material out there that, you know, the problems are hundred percent your partner's fault, right? This is oh, yeah. narcissist, this partner, the personality right. disorder, this part, you know, and there, that there's some value to that, but the narratives seem to be very skewed and that's just not what I see in my practice and my life. You know, I, I see better results when I'm working on changing me and when I'm helping mm -hmm. my clients really dive into self that's when things really start to grow. You know, here's the interesting thing. It's like some people 
some people equate relationship improvement to a relationship longevity. And those mm. two really aren't the same things. And you have to really get into that mindset to understand how that maturing process that one partner can initiate, it will show up as growth. It can't not. Mm. But sometimes growth does mean the relationship ends, right? And I know that yeah. I'm giving a really extreme example sure. because if people have the mindset that I'm growing and my growth is definitely going to make the relationship work, it that's not the point, right? The point yes. is, is that's the only way to get to a healthy relationship is mm -hmm. to focus on yourself. But that doesn't guarantee that your partner is going to you know, that your relationship with your partner is going to become secure because they have their work to do too. But by giving yourself that work and doing that work yourself, you're creating, you're dramatically increasing the odds that your partner is going to start shifting in positive ways. So that's what we're here doing, right? We're increasing the odds. Mm -hmm. You, the relationship will not get healthy if you don't do your own self work. It will not. It's, you ha it's a must, it's a mandate. Uh, and it all, if it's gonna work, it's gonna start there. And again, both partners have to be on board for that, but one partner can start initiate that, initiating that change. If nothing else, their health is no longer reinforcing their partner's insecure attachment. So well put. I love that you said that too. So many messages that I get are from people who are looking for some sort of silver bullet or magic wand mm -hmm. to change their partner and force the relationship to work. And I'm like, mm -hmm. that's the wrong approach to be taking. And I love that so much about your material because your material isn't promising a magic wand that'll magically change mm -hmm. your partner into exactly who somebody wants them to be. It's encouraging both partners to do what they can on their side to be healthy and to connect with each other as best they can so that the relationship itself will improve. And yes, sometimes that means yep. that two people decide this isn't the best place for us. And nobody wants to hear Absolutely. that, but it's yeah. it's kind of a good thing in disguise, you know? It is. And it's, 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 you know, I think that realistically it does end up working. Um, I believe that I believe in this work to the point mm -hmm. that I do believe if people have basic compatibility and they have love for each other. Um, but the mindset set can't be, I'm doing this work to make the relationship be saved. And right. it's interesting because there was a big point of, you know, kind of contention, not, not, contention, but disagreement in the subtitle of the book, Secure Love, mm -hmm. because the subtitle is create a relationship that lasts a lifetime. And that didn't mm -hmm. quite fit with me. And, you know, my, I have to work close with my editors and my publishing company. And we all have to kind of work together and they really liked it. And they, they felt like, okay, we're meeting people where they are. Um, mm -hmm. But I felt like, listen, I'm not really trying to make lifetime relationships. I like for that <laughs> to be a consequence of healthy relationships, but yeah. So yeah. So I, I went ahead and went with it. Um, but well, now that I'm is... curious. What was what was your idea for the subtitle? What would what would do you think if you had your way? What would a more fitting subtitle be? I think I was I was really into create a thriving a thriving relationship. Create, you know, it Love was it. it was anything along. I don't remember specifically, but it was anything along the lines of creating a healthy relationship. Yeah. And longevity in a lifetime relationship is a byproduct of that, um, mm -hmm. not or the can end be. goal. Yeah. Can mm -hmm. be, exactly. It doesn't mm -hmm. have to be. <laughs> and have a healthy relationship in part ways, you know. But yeah. if it is going to be a lifetime relationship, I don't want it to just be a lifetime. I, I, you've, but all three of us have seen plenty of people be together for a lifetime and have a terrible relationship throughout that lifetime. Oh, yeah. And yep. so that's not what I'm going for. I'm going for healthy. And if it's healthy and two people are committed to each other, then I want that lifetime to be a byproduct. I love it. Yeah. Um, one thing that I wanted to say was your account does such a great job. Um, before I say that, I, I do want to go back to the narcissism thing just one quickly, mm -hmm. because you do, because it's, it's difficult to have what you have, which is, which is a thriving account with over a million followers. Mm -hmm. And you don't talk about narcissism, which I, which I'm grateful. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe you do just very sparingly, but very sparingly, um, yeah. yeah. But in today's culture, that is such a buzzword. We've replaced, yeah. we've replaced the word 
self-centered with now, now that's just narcissism. So yeah. everyone is, you know, for, for so many people, it's like 60% of the population is now narcissist. Right. Anyways, <laughs> um, I just wanted to congratulate you on, on, you know, most accounts that grow so big that they're usually just, you know, like you said, it really just focusing on blame instead of what right. you do, which is focus on so much, so much vulnerability. And one of the things I love about your account is you really give people, um, like you give people the words and, and I know you're, mm -hmm. I know you're very proud of that and you should be because that's what people really need. They need the words. And I, I, I wish mm -hmm. I had a good example, but I, I think I can remember one. You say, we have to get to the point where we can say to our partner, when I shut down inside, I'm feeling overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. I'm feeling like nothing I say is going to be good. Nothing I say is going to mm -hmm. help. So it makes me just want to shut down. But I yeah. can see now, I can see now that that leaves you feeling unheard or alone or abandoned. And when we can frame it like that, because that's essentially what we should all learn how to do. I know I had to, not being a coach or a therapist or a counselor, just a regular person, I had to learn how important that is in my own relationship. Yeah. But you do such a good job at giving people those tools to learn how to be vulnerable and to say those, to say those, that's really difficult to even conceptualize, mm -hmm. much less to say to your partner in a vulnerable <laughs> moment. What, what advice would you give to people to, to kind of start them on that journey of how can I really, how can I really be more vulnerable? How can I be more mm -hmm. uh, self-aware? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, if I really want to give the most simplified answer, the first step is starting to recognize the bodily sensations that accompany what we call feelings and emotions, right? So many people um, either are so overwhelmed by those sensations that they aren't able to sort of sit and pinpoint it. Mm -hmm. And other people are so cut off from it that they really don't understand mm -hmm. that emotions happen in our body to begin with. And so whether you're aware of it or not, it's really hard to make that connection. We're not, you know, I, I appreciate the fact that somatic therapy, you know, understanding our emotions through the body has has taken on such a momentum in the last 10 years because it's really been the missing link in psychology. Um, and that is changing everything. And I think when we can really start to tap into that first sensation and then start listening to it and being curious about it and saying, what is this trying to tell me? Can I put some words to this? Can I sit with this? This is mm -hmm. the pain, right? This is it. This is the threat. This is the sadness. This is all of it is here. And what am I, what, what can it tell me? What can I learn from it right now? And that kind of sets you on this journey of knowing more about what to say, because what to say is already there. It's just a matter of finding it and starting to put words to it. And you know, once, you know, I have this out kind of outlined in the book, how to kind of go through this process. And then also just getting some therapy that's designed to help you know what's there. And in the, those most vulnerable, tender, ouch spots in your, that, that are really showing up in your body. And so it can be a matter of, okay, my partner just, you know, something really specific. Like I, I noticed a kind of a vacant look flash on their face when I was trying to tell the story. And all mm -hmm. of a sudden, a flare inside of me happened, right? My chest started to get all itchy or tight or whatever that is. And maybe what that's saying is I'm not being heard. You know, they're gone. Do my needs matter? Do they want to stay connected to me? That's a, a fear. What am I afraid of? You know, and then what am I now doing with that? Now I want to start protesting because I'm trying to pull you back in. Hear me, hear me, hear me, hear me. So I can feel safe and this horrible ouch will go away inside of me. And then what happens is, is when we just launch into that protest, now what does our partner do, right? Who knows what was actually going on with them, first of all, so they might right. feel misunderstood or they don't know how to respond. And so they're, they're going to need to do their own work around this. But um, just sticking with the first partner, that, that's when we kind of have that ability to say, hey, when you see me in this protesty place, here's really what's happening is mm -hmm. I start to get scared. I start to get scared that maybe you're you're not present. And then instead of asking you, because I never learned how to put words to that, I just want to start, my, my protest is my way of trying to pull you back in. And I can really see how that lands on you in a way that, you know, doesn't feel good for you. Yeah. Yeah, I um, love that. 
our ability to reveal what's going on inside of us. Like I'm feeling really afraid right now. I'm feeling really mm -hmm. like you're not listening to me. Being able to reveal those kind of things. It's like, it's like what you said about it kind of being the missing piece. It's part of my huge problem with all of these accounts talking so much about narcissism, because I really feel mm -hmm. like a lot of a lot of people who are being labeled as narcissists are probably people who don't know how to reveal their inner experience. Mm -hmm. And so their, their yeah. actions are looking very self-centered. Like they don't care about the other person, you know, there are those protest yeah. actions that, but really someone's just saying, wow, they aren't acknowledging my experience at all. They're shutting down. They clearly don't care, right? That must be a yeah. narcissist. And really, it's, it's one of the things I love so much about your account, giving people the words to be able to say, Hey, I feel like you don't care about my experience. And that's why I'm, right. that's why I'm doing this thing. That's why I'm acting like this. Yes. And also yeah. even further, how can we turn this around? Um, having a partner be able to reveal their inner experience and reach out for connection instead of just shutting down and blocking everything off. Julie, I, right. I really believe you're, you're saving relationships. If, if my, oh, if myself 100%. and my, yeah, if myself and my ex-husband yeah. had been able to say, I'm shutting down because I'm afraid I'm shutting down because I feel like, like our connection is in danger and I don't know what else to do except to shut down or to yell. Um, I, I don't think I would have been divorced. So I think there's a lot, oh, there are a goodness. lot of couples out there who probably owe the, their marriage continuing to, to you and your account and the words that you've given them. So thank you for that on behalf well, of those couples who aren't able to talk I mean, to Honestly, you. That, that right there is why I'm here. I mean, ultimately, mm -hmm. just, mm -hmm. you know, you guys have helped so many people too. And it's just that feeling of knowing that you're making a difference is everything. Yeah. So I always deeply appreciate when I get that feedback. It just really mm -hmm. fills me up and keeps me going. So yeah. thank you. It's very Can motivating, I quote you real isn't quick? it? In it is. Book? Yep. <laughs> I'm sorry. Can I quote you real quick in the book? Because yep. this is this this is talking exactly about what you're you say at one point, I think we're missing each other right now. What are you mm. hearing me say? And I think mm. like I feel like healthy relationships or secure relationships, maybe I should say, they really hinge on both partners being able to do that. Um it doesn't have to be exactly at the same time, but we both mm -hmm. have to be able to do that to each other. I mean, how many mm -hmm. conflicts, how many fights could be completely just cut off with, with one person say, I think we're missing each other. What are you mm -hmm. hearing me say? And, mm -hmm. and actually caring to listen to what that person is, is trying to express. Um, you do a great job talking about, uh, just how much shame comes into the picture, how much triggers come into mm -hmm. the, come into the equation. Um, I don't mean to pigeonhole you, but if you mm -hmm. can talk a little bit about, um, I know how important it is to recognize that shame and those triggers, mm -hmm. but what I struggle with personally, even somebody who's really interested in this stuff, mm -hmm. it feels like, it feels like in the moment, um, that part of my brain switches off and now I'm in the reactive part of my brain and I can't even, the only thing I can do is once I'm, once the, either the damage is done or once the situation is over, then I can go back and self-reflect and think, yes. but, wh but why didn't I respond the way I wanted to respond now, mm -hmm. knowing what I know now? Is mm -hmm. there anything that you can help poor little me with? You know, <laughs> I'm sure no one else struggles with that problem no, but me. No but one. Right. <laughs> no one. Everyone. What, I mean, what can I do in that moment to it's just... Yeah. I mean, there's so, there's a few strategies and none, none of which are perfect. Unfortunately, when sure. you go into that red light brain, it is incredibly difficult when we're, you're in a state of threat, right? And when yes. we get threatened, we go into protection and it's really, you know, our nervous system is sort of hijacked, um, that rational part of the brain. And it's very, very difficult. And sometimes the best thing you can do is just, you know, take a break, breathe. Sometimes the best thing you can do is just screw up and, and repair. repair it later because yeah, yeah. those repairs create safety and safety is the antidote to the red light brain, right? And so mm -hmm. safety actually contributes, safety in the relationship will contribute to more co-regulation. So sometimes just focusing on the repairs can give people a better sense of empowerment. Um, yeah. But it really comes down to, I think in the moment, um, 
and you know, I might, I might tech, not tech, this might not be technically accurate, but I, I think there's something to be said for being able to access empathy in these moments is, is yes. huge. Mm -hmm. Empathy is actually one of the most self-regulating experiences mm -hmm. because you're out of your own self and your own fear. Now it's very difficult to take that leap, right? When you're in protective place, but the more people are able to dive into themselves and really find those deepest, darkest places where we view each other. I mean, we all have these insecure parts, no matter how many other parts we have that are confident, right? Insecure. We all have these parts that say, what if I am bad? What if I am a piece of shit? What yeah. if I am an awful person? What if I am just too much? And you know, a loser. I mean, the terrible things, right? That yeah. that people have inside of them. And that's what's being protected at the end of the day. When you go into this red light brain is I don't want to go to that place. So what I have mm -hmm. to do is I have to stay up and protect. And that's what we're protecting. And so I have, you know, this experience with my daughter recently where she had some, she's in um, ninth grade. So there's a lot of girl drama going on right now. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's really hard, especially when you have these kind of like emotionally kind of healthy kids and like the other ones aren't super emotionally healthy. And, <laughs> oh, and it's like, but I they're, they're imagine. friends. They love them and care about yeah. them. Right. And so, mm -hmm. and so she was telling me this, you know, we were talking about it for a long, long time, hours. We've talked about it. And um, this thing happened and they were the, the three girls in the group kind of turned on her. Right. Which was oh. devastating for her. Mm -hmm. And um, over this kind of mistake that she had made. So, um, what happened was, is that she was so mad at them, right? She was so stuck in kind of mad and blame, you know, and uh, couldn't empathize with them. Like couldn't mm -hmm. because she was in protective place and through talking and talking and talking. And I was really able to help her dive into her. And we were able to find this place in her where she's afraid that maybe she is the bad one. Maybe she is in the mm -hmm. wrong yeah, we were really able to get to some of that. Maybe, you know, and, and she doesn't, you know, wanting to convince them that she's a good person. It was kind of like that, like this theme around, and this is what I see with virtually every couple I work with, right? Yeah, yeah. And when I was really able to get her down into that darkest place of herself and empathize with that and feel that, I mean, that brought up a lot of sadness in her. And, mm. you know, this is kind of how it works. After we kind of went to that place, that's where she found the empathy for them. Oh, All of a sudden, I, you know, we didn't have to force it. We didn't have to say, hey, why don't you look at their side of the story? Like it naturally happened when she was mm. able to go into her darkest place. And I was there to help her with that and find mm -hmm. that and start putting words to that. And she was able to start helping herself and empathize with herself. So I think there's just so much to be said again for the self-work around this, because really until we can, it's not until we can fully go to those dark places and really show up for ourselves and have help from others um, that we, we can't, you know, we can't really access full empathy without, without that. Mm -hmm. Oh, beautiful. You know, access I love some, that. Some empathy, but, mm -hmm. but not empathy when we're scared from what the other person right. is doing. You know, mm -hmm. you can empathize with a homeless person and have enormous compassion for them and be overwhelmed mm -hmm. with empathy and overwhelmed for sadness for their condition. But if they start throwing food at you that you give them, right, um, right, which happened to me once, right? Mm -hmm. I gave them, no. I gave someone some food and she started throwing it at me. I'm obviously mentally ill. It's really hard yeah. to maintain the empathy, right? And that's kind of right. ha what happens with with people in a fight with with partners. It's like. Yeah, we empathize with each other so much. We really do. It's very real. But when we get in those fights and they're throwing, we're throwing food at each other, it's mm -hmm. very difficult to maintain that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This reminds me too of something that our friend Stan Tatkin, can I say that since we yeah. had him on the show? Is he our friend now? <laughs> um, hey, Ricky, are we allowed to say that early on in this, early on in this pod, the podcast, we have referred to Julie as our friend, Julie Minato at the Surrey oh, we, have, we have, we called yeah. you our friend yeah. long before you were here, but now we'll just continue well, saying call that. You, I love friends and I'm going to call you my friend. <laughs> okay, fantastic. That's so that. our, our friend that. Stan Tatkin, who we're very close to and on a, on a first name basis, yes, right? Yeah, absolutely. Of course, um, yeah. Stan told us, I just loved this quote back in the podcast that he did with us. He said, "You, it also helps to kind of be your partner's whisperer. 
And that Mm -hmm. really landed with me because I know um, I grew up in a household where we didn't, we weren't calm when things went wrong. We were yelling, we were emotionally reactive. Now my, my partner did not. So he's got a special skill set that I don't have. And he notices when I start getting wound up and he kind of is my whisperer in that way. I can't see it when I start getting upset and he can. And I just love what Stan said about partners being able to, if one has a special skill in noticing when the other Mm -hmm. one's wound up, um, my partner jumps in and he kind of saves us from escalating by, you know, taking my hand or saying, I noticed that you're getting really really reactive about this. And that really just, it stops the fight in its tracks. And I think there's a really beautiful thing that couples can do to, to resolve, to be a team when things, you know, I have my skills in slowing the fight down. You have your, you have Mm -hmm. your skills in slowing it down. And it's a beautiful thing when couples can work as a team to be there for each other. So thank you, Stan, for that. I love thinking of myself as my partner's whisperer and him the same, someone who knows, who knows you very well and can rein the fight in before it gets too crazy. And what a, what a more palpable and felt and beautiful word is whisperer than (laughs) (laughs) co-regulator. Well, he, he, I do. I love his writing. He is, he, that's one of his wonderful skills. Stan is very good at metaphors and, and, and explaining things in a way that it's like, wow, that really lands and is, it's palatable. I can, right. I can do something with that. And it doesn't sound so clinical and scary. Exactly. Yep. And Julie, you Love talk it. about in your book, um, accepting your partner's influence. And I know Gottman's mm. talk about that a lot too. Mm. I, I love, but I just love that concept because it goes back to exactly what you were saying, Ricky, where it's like in the heat of the moment, we really need to be able to accept each other's influence. I mean, how important mm-hmm. is it's, that's really the moments where it matters the most when your partner can lay a hand on you and can like yeah. kind of just recenter you mm-hmm. like, it's okay they can validate you, which I would love to talk about in a minute because you you, you yeah. touch on validation so much. They can validate what you're going through, but also kind of like calm you down in a respectful way. Not like you need to calm down, but right. Mm-hmm. Like they could they can yeah. do it in a in a very warm they're and not soft. Calm, they're not doing it for you, but they're helping you. Yeah. Right. Like, right. Yeah. So if you can talk a little bit because you 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 do mention just how vital validation is mm-hmm. in, in so many aspects of our relationship. So um, I would love for you to talk about um, kind of the best way that people can do that mm-hmm. and maybe the barriers that get, or, you know, that come up that prevent us from doing that. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, I do do spend a lot of time and energy on validation because I have witnessed it, the power of it, you know, yeah. not just in my mm-hmm. personal life, but in my work with couples, um, the only way that I can get couples in a settled place and get them in their green light brain so that they can do the work is with, is with validation. Mm -hmm. Uh, Because with validation is implied understanding implied that they have been able to, you know, um, put their words out in a way that I'm really showing them, Hey, I really understand you. And it makes sense to me. Your anger makes a lot of sense to me. And, you know, me and, and, you know, many couples therapists out there and myself included earlier in my career, um, you know, probably one of the biggest blocks was not sitting and helping the partner with their anger. Right. It was kind of like, let's gloss over that and go right back, right into those, (laughs) you know, deeper vulnerabilities and just being able to validate someone's anger, that anger will get out of the way when you, Uh, when you validate it, you might have to go back and forth. They might go down, up, down, up, and you kind of have to follow them, but eventually, so that is just, you know, first of all, that's just validating anger is, is just one example. There are lots of experiences that someone can be sharing with you that, that aren't related to anger. You're not accepting how they act on those experiences, but you are making a lot of space for the feelings. And the re- one of the reasons it's so powerful is there are many, many people that I work with that have never been validated once in their life. Yeah. Um, yeah. We just don't grow up in validating homes, you know? Mm-hmm. And um, so 
Yeah. I mean, I just put such a focus on that because it probably, I think is, you know, probably the most powerful way to help someone self-regulate and co-regulate is to help or or whisper to them um, (laughs) is to let them know that you see them, that you hear them, that their feelings make sense to you. They're not alone with it. And um, what kind of blocks that? I mean, one block is just not having any clue what it looks like, what it sounds like, not having felt experience of it. Sure. Um, And so kind of that's where I'm kind of trying to come in and say, here's what it feels like. Here's what it sounds like, you know, giving those tactical skills. Um, Another thing is just like you said, when you're in that red light brain, you know, validation does require that you are able to kind of think straight. So um, again, we have, you know, this ability for couples to co-regulate each other. I think Ricky, you brought up a really good point that some, for some reason, in some of these moments, your partner is more resourced, right? Mm -hmm. They're more resourced there. Something is going on with them that they're able to be the one to reach. And I'm sure in other times you're more resourced or around other topics, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, that is, you know, one way. I and mean, I think it's, you know, you using validation in safer moments when it is easier to do can give you practice and can give you, you know, the experience of being successful with it, which is going to help you have tools. Sometimes the most dysregulating thing about conflict is not knowing that you have a sense of empowerment and tools. Mm-hmm. Um Yeah. So sometimes there are just wounds built up in the relationship where it is more difficult to show up for your partner. And in that case, we need to look at repairing some of these old wounds, which again, I address in the book. Uh, And then sometimes, um, shoot, there was another good block that I lost. Sorry. (laughs) Can I I piggyback on that real quick, Ricky? Oh yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. One of the blocks that I feel like is so important, and you talk a lot about this in the book, and you're so good at talking about the negative cycle. I think one of the blocks from that, we can, we can validate in this environment, but it makes it so much harder to validate when your partner is not being vulnerable. Like when they're yeah. screaming at you, you're a self-centered yeah. narcissist. You're so lazy. Yeah. All you think about is yourself. Yes. When I'm teaching, if I'm teaching, I don't teach, but if I'm if I'm telling, if I'm helping people to validate, they're looking at me like, how am I supposed to validate that? They just called me a self-centered narcissist. What I, I don't understand. You want me to just agree with them? And you made a, such an important point there where it's not agreeing with the no. behavior, nor is it agreeing with any accusations or name calling. Mm-hmm. What's so important is when, if that person could be vulnerable and instead of calling you a self-centered narcissist, they say, I'm feeling like my needs don't matter to you. And that makes me feel very hurt. That makes me feel abandoned. Mm-hmm. Those are feelings that you can now much easier valid. You can easily, easy, more easily mm-hmm. validate those. Um, yeah. Does that make sense? Like a, a block would mm-hmm. be that person not appropriately being vulnerable and just throwing sure. out. Getting, right. getting in their own way. Right. Yeah. And if I, if I may right. jump in on that, Jimmy, um, my partner doesn't have as many of those words. Um, I think sure. it's, it's a real mm-hmm. issue for men sometimes because men don't get as much of that social training as women mm-hmm. do, you know, what they, you guys don't get taught all sure. the words mm-hmm. to be anyway. Um, feelings are weakness. So, yeah. Right, exactly. So um, he doesn't have a lot of practice when he's wound mm-hmm. up saying, I'm feeling hurt right now. Um, so I like to ask him directly. That's one of my tools mm-hmm. that I have. Yes. I'm able to recognize that in his anger, he's not being vulnerable. And I'll, and I'll say, mm-hmm. like, you, you're, I can tell how upset you are. Like, yeah. is, there, is there something underneath that that might be driving this? And then he's able to look and access that and go, oh, my gosh, yeah, yeah. I felt like you weren't listening mm-hmm. at all. So that's very helpful, too. What a great way to interrupt the negative cycle. I mean, mm-hmm. yeah. 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 And I, I, let me, let me add there this other one more layer on top of that, that can be really helpful. Um, going back to validation is sometimes it can be really helpful to, to v- meet them where they are and validate mm. what you're seeing, which, you know, if I'm working with a couple and one of the partners is saying, I think they're just a narcissist. I think that they're mm-hmm. just self-centered. I'm going to immediately dive into that and join them in that. And I'm going to say, listen, you're really hurt. I mean, I get it. I'm hearing you. Mm -hmm. Like there's a lot of crap going on in this. 
-hmm. and you end up feeling all these terrible things. And it may, you're making the way that you make sense of it is, well, they must just be a narcissist, right? This behavior I'm seeing is so atrocious that the way that it makes sense to you is they're a narcissist Mm -hmm. and they're self-centered. And I get that. You know, I think that there might be, and I would like to learn this together. I think there might be another way that we can all make sense of it. But right now, Mm -hmm. that's where you are. Mm-hmm. Right. And that that will often get people into green light so then that they're uh, more able to take in the next step, which is, can you tell me a little bit more about what's underneath that part of you that's making sense of it? Why does it help you to make sense of it in that way? Mm-hmm. You know, uh, and so that's when that's you big. sometimes that's an inlet that just validating where they are. I'm not condoning them calling their partner a narcissist. I'm not. Right. But I am help, helping make sense of why they're needing to go there. Yeah, sure. you're getting curious about it. And that's good too. Yes. That's like somebody's somebody's looking at why I'm feeling that way. That that would be a green light brain thing, wouldn't it? It would. Someone and it's, it's also deeply de- shaming. You know, yeah, a lot of people exactly. are used to being shamed over calling their partner names. And, you know, a real kind of novice therapy move would be, well, that's not true. They're not a narcissist, you know, Mm -hmm. and kind of not meeting them in that. And so I like to meet people and then move them. And anything I'm, you know, part of what I'm doing and putting out there are these skills that I'm doing with the couples I work with. Yeah. Right. That's, that's where, you know, it all, I get it all is from what I'm doing with couples, not just what I'm helping them do with each other, but what I'm doing with that, with each partner to get them into green light. Why are these types of relationships, why do they need to be locked up in a therapy room? Why mm-hmm. does the, why do we ha- why do I have to go to school and learn how to get people into green light, learn how to be emotionally supportive so I can give them therapy um, and then not them not be able to do this with, you know, with each other mm-hmm. and in my personal uh, life. I guess r- r- really, really um, good point that you made too, that, um, there are novice therapists. So if any of you are out there and you're saying, you're thinking, I went to couples therapy and the therapist completely invalidated me and they're an idiot. I hated the experience. Um, I want to, um, reassure people that all therapists are different. And if you, if you Mm -hmm. had an experience with one and they didn't jive with you or they did invalidate you, there are others out there that you might have a better experience with. So, I know, um, so a question. Yeah. yeah. A, and that's yeah. not to say that they're a bad therapist, but if, if the, you don't jive with them, there are more. Um, I had a question, um, if I may derail wherever we were going with that next, um, Julie, do you have advice for couples where, what to do if one partner perhaps in a marriage is very resistant to couples counseling or reading mm-hmm. books or working with the other mm-hmm. partner? I talked to lots of couples who, mm-hmm. um, couples. I talked to lots of sing like a one part of the couple who says, we both really want to make this work, but my partner is mm-hmm. not going to go to therapy and they are not going to read any books. Mm-hmm. What can we do? Yeah. Common problem. I actually have this in the script part of the book, like how you oh, can wonderful. kind of voice your concerns over this. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I am always a big, big fan. Again, I'm of meeting people where they are. And so what happens is, is this topic of going to therapy becomes part of a negative cycle where mm-hmm. one partner is saying, you don't care because you don't want to go to therapy. You you know, you refuse to look at your stuff, you know, coming at it in this kind of blaming critical way, kind of shaming, right? Yeah. Um, or you're the problem because dot, 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 you, you know, in this case, you won't go to therapy. And so, you know, do I want the couple to go to therapy? Absolutely. I believe in therapy. Mm-hmm. I'm a therapist. I want everybody to get good therapy, but we're much more likely to get there by meeting our partners where they are and mm-hmm. just saying, listen, Help me understand what is scary to you because it matters to them. Maybe they have associate therapy with the end of a relationship. Mm -hmm. Maybe like Mm -hmm. all of us, we've seen so many people go to therapy and what happens? They're divorced the next year. I mean, it's like virtually every couple you hear about that's divorced, they say, well, we tried therapy, right? Mm -hmm. Or therapy is going to make us worse, or we're going to get into this therapy environment. And once again, I'm going to be the bad guy. And now it's not just you coming at me. It's, it's both you, you know, I'm going to get ganged yeah. up on, or some people are just so afraid of going into their stuff 
it's better to just try to keep a lid on it and function in life than it is mm -hmm. to start opening that stuff. So there's all right. there. Everybody who doesn't want to go to therapy has a really, really good reason for it. That doesn't mean that the way they're acting on that good reason is healthy or, or effective. Mm. Right. Mm. But yeah. we can, I think it's the starting point of meeting them where they are trying to understand and saying, okay, that makes a lot of sense to me. Like actually not going to therapy is kind of what you're saying to me is that's kind of way you're the way that you're protecting the relationship. Oh, right. And, and that's yeah. commendable. I appreciate mm -hmm. that. You're over here associating with therapy with making it worse. And this relationship is going to end, mm -hmm. you know, if nothing else, that tells me you value the relationship, right? It's like yeah. therapy, you know, we might not be in the best spot, but if therapy makes it worse, then what's that going to do to us? Oh yeah. Now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's meeting them. But then kind of adding in either in that conversation or maybe later, and I think later is probably a better idea. Like, look, I've been really thinking about this and I get it. You know, it, I'm looking at it through a new lens and I get that it means something to you and that it's scary for you. And, and I want to honor that, right? But there's this other part of me that's like really recognizing we're stuck. And I yeah. think that there are some really good arguments to kind of going ahead and going forward with this, even, even if we're scared. And that's certainly what I would like to do because I think there might be some value in it. You know, if we start up and, it, and things do start to erode, that's another conversation to have. But um, I, yeah. you know, I would really, really want to do this. And then, you know, that's, that's kind of, you know, planting the seed. And then I, I do recommend in the book that sometimes we have to increase the firmness of our boundaries. And if mm -hmm. it gets to the point that the relationship really is not working and I cannot go on with it like it is, that conversation might need to look like, I see where you're coming from and it matters to me, but I'm at the point where we got to get some extra help or I don't know how much I can, much more I can do of this. But we can always, no matter what that boundary looks like, we can always start by really getting where they are and why that is a good idea to them to not go to therapy. Yeah. yeah. What a what a powerful spin on that, that that you don't usually hear. I love that, Julie. Thank you. Well, thank you. Yeah. And if, if, if someone comes to me just to put this out there and they're resistant to therapy, I'm not going to try to sell therapy to them. Right. I'm going to try to understand, tell me about the resistance and why this resistance means something to you and why you're needing to have that resistance. Mm. Now, guess what we're going to get down into? The vulnerability. That's the way I get in. Yeah. Then I start having them share the vulnerability. Then we're doing the therapy right. yeah. without me having to sell them anything. Amazing. Uh, uh, one really popular misconception with therapy, too, is that you're there to have a judge tell you who's right about an <laughs> argument, you know, when yeah. really one of the best things that I think therapists do for couples is give them tools on how to communicate with each other. That's that really like, exactly. if that's how everybody yeah. thought of it, everybody would be running to it. But that's, you know, I think a lot well, of people and, think and it's just someone something. with a gavel. <laughs> yeah. And let me add something to that with the tools. Mm -hmm. Um, the tools are extremely important, but the way I give tools is through felt experience. I'm giving uh, you the felt experience right here, right now, that when these mm -hmm. triggers are alive of using these tools, instead of teaching you what to do outside of the room. Got and it, those got tools it. start to become internalized and then they start naturally taking them outside of the room. And I can't obviously do that in a book, right? Right, um, right. With the book, I have to be more explicit about here's what to try on your own. But mm -hmm. um, I think that there's so much value in this type of work. I'm doing EFT, emotionally focused therapy for couples. That's how we're trained. We're trained to provide corrective emotional experiences around what's happening right in front of us. Because if you bring a couple into couples therapy, 100% their stuff is going to come up and they're going to go into a negative cycle. And now mm -hmm. I have the opportunity to work with it real time. Yeah. And correct me if I'm wrong, but the theory is that and you, you wouldn't say this is theory because you've seen it happen over and over, obviously, but the theory <laughs> is um, that when I give them that experience of both of them actually seeing each other, maybe for the first time, mm -hmm. being vulnerable and being mm -hmm. and feeling validated mutually, mm -hmm. that that is so comforting to our nervous system. That's such a mm -hmm. that's such a positive experience that we can only naturally want more of that. Is that correct? Like, 
Yes. Um, ex- yes, definitely. Um, it, part of it is I, I want not only for them to feel so good, but also to feel successful with a new way ah. of communicating. So it's not just the connection. That's a huge piece of it, but they're not, they have not been successful up to this point. Right. So when they're, when I'm sitting there and, and you know, I'm very kind of this is me being silly tongue in cheek, but I'm very controlling, <laughs> you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm so kind and gentle, right? But I'm also co- creating a very, very controlled environment where you're not talking to each other. When you first come to my my room, I'm, I'm facilitating every single thing that you're saying mm-hmm. to each other. I'm spending time with each partner diving into your stuff. Now I'm gonna help you communicate, diving into your stuff. Now I'm gonna help. You know, and in the, some of the hardest couples I work with are those who have been in, in other types of therapy where this isn't the case and they've oh. really developed all these bad habits that we're just here to spew and vent and you're yeah. kind of just here to like somehow mm. create some sort of safety, which, you know. Um, but anyway, so the point is this, is that they haven't had experience talking about whatever these topics are or, you know, whatever it is for them in a way that's been successful. So what am I doing? Yeah. I am helping them be successful. And if you figure out a way to be successful at something when you haven't been, you're just going to do it. You're just going to eventually yeah. that that's the way you're going to get the need met. Why bother trying these other things? So I'm just sort of trying to wait, make their old coping mechanisms, extinct them and give them some new skills. But again, it's not teaching the skills conceptually. It's experiencing the skills, yeah. the felt experience of closeness, the the ability to be successful, the ability to have, you know, being heard, understood, validated, and responded to. You know, none of this is matters if we can't live a life together and work through our problems together and figure out money and figure out sex and figure out parenting and figure out where we're gonna live and in-laws. Mm-hmm. The work is exists and I do this work to help them not only feel close, but to get through those conversations in a way, again, where they can actually work together. So it's not just touchy feely, it's also really practical. <laughs> yeah, and the experience of that success that they have connecting um, probably gives them new confidence that they didn't have before. We have connected so, before and that felt absolutely. wonderful. I believe that we can do that again in the future. Yes. Yes, there's so many layers. We're facilitating empathy. We're mm-hmm. giving them words, you know, just many, many layers to why it's so effective mm-hmm. when done well. You know, any type mm-hmm. of therapy is only as good as the therapist doing it. So if you do go to EFT therapy and you're not getting anywhere, again, kind of to your point, Ricky, maybe just try mm-hmm. someone else. I mean, we're all yeah. at different levels of advanced and some couples have more complication that they're going to need a therapist who's more advanced. And there's, yeah. you know, it's not... It is, it is a, uh, you know, finding a good therapist can be a real trial and error process. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll let Ricky do a, I don't know how many more questions we have, but I have, I love the way we, we've talked about how we protect ourselves numerous times and you have a really good, this quote blew me away. Um, you said, remember shame tells us to hide the parts of us mm-hmm. that we don't believe are acceptable to others. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you went on to say like, so if we don't like being seen as incompetent or viewing ourselves as incompetent, it's much safer to project that onto someone else sometimes. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, that's big. Mm -hmm. That's Mm -hmm. so big. Um, How it's so vital. I'm sure you would agree that we, that we all pay attention to how we protect ourselves in all the, or or how our shame manifests itself. And um, you talk a lot about validating our, Mm -hmm. it, it starts with validating our own, ourself, you know, um, Mm -hmm. you say self validation leads to self acceptance and that's Mm -hmm. um, like the opposite of shame. Um, how's it, how important, how important is that? Can you speak to that on, on how essential can't do this work without it? (laughs) You know, that's where we're talking about our attachment style with our own selves. You know, what happens is, is we're born, right. And we have these parents and, you know, there are, are everything. There's really no Mm-hmm. differentiation between the infant and the the care the primary caretaker usually the mother um and so we are learning and ha- developing a relationship with self based on how our caretakers are interacting with us that's the template 
the way they're interacting with us. If we're getting messages from them, we're too much or we're, nobody's really going to show up. We just don't learn how to have that healthy relationship with self. And then that healthy relationship with self is then later what we take into our you know adult or adolescent relationships. And there's just no way around having a healthy relationship with yourself and being able to meet your own emotional needs that for validation, for acceptance, you know, um, and that's not to say that we don't need help with that because we do, we, we get it. We get a relationship with ourselves, healthy or not healthy by how, you know, we start with a relationship with other period. You know, it doesn't start randomly. Mm -hmm. Our, our relationship with ourselves comes from relationship with other, which is the early mm -hmm. caretakers. So yes, we need to learn as adults to be there for ourselves and be there, our own caretaker, but that doesn't by any means mean that we can't have help from others, right? Um, yeah. And that help from others is the attachment style and attachment security and safety with others. And that can, getting messages from another person, you are good, you are valuable, you are mm -hmm. acceptable, is going to positively impact our relationship with self. Yeah. But and perhaps our is it is that I, I sorry to interrupt, but is that no, okay. not something that we can do completely alone in a vacuum either? I see that a, a lot mm -hmm. online. Um, this like staunch individualism, take mm -hmm. care of yourself, and and I really that kind of flies in the face of things that couples therapists tell us, which is exactly mm -hmm. what you're saying right now that we we learn who we are and how valuable we are in those caregiver infant relationships, mm -hmm. you can't do this stuff all by yourself alone to, mm -hmm. to feel like you're worthy and good. And that's another reason that therapy is such a valuable experience because a therapist mm -hmm. like yourself helps couples communicate to each other. I care about you. I'm mm -hmm. here for you. Right. Sorry, I didn't and, mean and to derail your point. That was wonderful. No, that's okay. <laughs> I mean, at the beginning of the work, they can't give that to each other. So guess where they get it from me. Right. Right, right. Right. And so I'm using that relationship with each of them mm -hmm. that they, I am now going to transfer from me and mm -hmm. them to between them. It's almost like I'm the stand in caretaker mm -hmm. until they mm -hmm. start to get there on their own. And, um, you know, that's one reason I shifted early in my career from individual work to couples work is because I wasn't wow. happy with creating this beautiful relationship between me and them and them not having it in their real life. Yeah. Um, but you know, it's like, can you do this work on your own? You know, to me, self-work and relationship work, they're, they're just so one in the same that I don't know how you even, I mean, I do know this, you have to have a healthy relationship with self before you mm -hmm. can really, truly, really, you know, connect with another person. But then, but then that connection with the other person, if it's healthy, it's going to, you know, so mm -hmm. it's like th that chicken or egg argument. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's um, and that's that's nuance that's missing from a lot of the content that you see online. It really is. I think very um, much so. Yeah, I, I love how you put that. You have to have a healthy relationship with yourself before you can, but also you need to have healthy relationships with others before you can feel really good about yourself and able to take that yeah. work on too. Um, the the way right, I treat it. If you're in an environment at work or with your extended uh -huh. family or with your friends where you're constantly being given these messages, you're not enough or yeah. we're not really there for you or nobody can understand you or nobody can make, or we're just going to argue with every, I mean, it's really hard, right? Yeah. It's really hard <laughs> to feel good about yourself when you've got dark negative energy coming at you all mm -hmm. the time. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that people can get some of that from non-romantic relationships if they're starting the work? And they're needing to needing help, feeling good about themselves and confident. Um, can they get some secure uh, behavior and work mm -hmm. scripts from non romantic relationships to start that movement toward a healthy relationship? Absolutely, absolutely. I think that you know there there is something very unique about attachment bonded relationships, but all relationships have some attachment energy there. And, you know, if you're getting messages from other humans that are good enough messages, no, no, you know, sometimes our friends aren't perfect and, you know, our family members aren't perfect. But if you're getting good enough messages that, hey, you're valuable to me, I really want to hear you. I want to know you. You know, I can accept these dark parts of you. You know, I can still accept you when you mess up, you know, even if, yeah. you know, I don't like what you did, like, 
um, then absolutely that can start to shift our view of self and shift the way we show up for ourselves. So the healthier the world is, the healthier the human population is, the healthier everybody else gets. It just feeds on itself. Beautiful. I, I have one, one last question and then I'll let Ricky close. Um, I think one of the biggest things when I, as I was studying this stuff that kind of blew my mind is if you had someone in an anxious and avoidant dynamic, I, I feel like, correct me if I'm wrong, but the anxious partner has a tendency to feel like I'm over here. I'm doing all the work. I'm mm -hmm. the one that cares mm -hmm. about this relationship. If, mm -hmm. if it wasn't for me and the efforts that I'm putting in that aren't being reciprocated, this whole thing would crash down. Um, mm -hmm. What advice would you give to an anxious listener who they, I'm not going to say that they need some tough love, but one of the plot mm -hmm. twists that I realized mm -hmm. the more I studied was that anxious partners can be just as emotionally unavailable as mm -hmm. their avoidant partners. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot that they don't see. And there's a lot that mm -hmm. they don't, um, they don't quite know how to be vulnerable and they don't quite, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and they justify some of their protests and criticisms because, well, well, because mm -hmm. they're doing this and that. What advice mm -hmm. would you give to that person to kind of wake them up a little bit to like, mm -hmm. <laughs> there's two sides to this coin? Yeah. I mean, for sure. I mean, there, there's always the relationship where one partner truly is the one that's committed to working and committed to, protecting the relationship. Um, but a lot of times they both are committed, but it's just showing up in different ways. So the, mm -hmm. the way the anxious partner is committing is trying to make things better, close the distance, you know, kind of desperately put all this action to place and energize. And that's their way of, of preserving what they have or, or making mm -hmm. it better and, and saving the relationship, protecting the relationship. The avoidant partner just has a different way of doing that. There's this damage mm -hmm. control. Mm -hmm. What we have might not be ideal, but if we start rocking the boat, things are mm -hmm. going to get worse. And so they're both really protecting the relationship in their own way. Um, anxious partners, because they are so kind of their emotions are so big and they feel all this pain um, and they, uh, you know, they're putting so much energy into fixing things. But I love this line. A lot of times it's watering the plant with gasoline. Oh, yeah, no. it takes yeah. energy to water with gasoline, but you're mm -hmm. not, you, you, nobody's doing this on purpose. They just haven't yet found what's what works and how to be successful. And when we're getting all this information that avoidant partners are, you know, bad and evil and narcissistic and mm -hmm. don't care and not committed, yeah. what is that doing? It's reinforcing, I want to change you. I want to change. You have to change. You have to change. You have to change. That's the mm -hmm. gasoline. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the water is, watering yourself and being able in an interaction, you know, you know, to your point, anxious partners are definitely not fully emotionally aware. Yeah, they feel right. the emotions, but they're not competent and successful at stepping back, checking in, where is mm -hmm. this in my body? I mean, they're often as equipped to do that as the avoidant counterpart. Um, but they confuse once again, the overwhelm and the fact that they feel the pain and they're aware of the pain with emotional availability, right? Or they right. confuse emotional venting with mm. emotional availability, mm, right. or they confuse their partner coming to them and sharing a problem and them saying, well, what's wrong? Why are you this? Or why are you that? And kind of trying to, to force their partner to talk about their feelings. That's not emotional availability, mm -hmm. you know? And again, nobody's doing this on purpose, right? We're doing everything we know how to do. Bo both right. partners typically are really truly doing everything they know how to do. And they read these books that say, and they read my my content online, right? Even you can use that and they say, you got to tell me, you know, what's happening in your body or what are you scared <laughs> of right now? And but it's, right. it's, it's not, hey, here's what's going on with me, mm -hmm. right? When you bring this up to me, you had this problem at work, what happens in my body is I start going, oh no, panic, you know, are you upset or bad things gonna happen? And then I wanna kind of anxiously, I think, I think I'm being emotionally av available because I'm anxiously trying to get you to talk more about it or something, but mm -hmm. it's really about soothing my own nervous system mm -hmm. right. instead of showing up for your nervous system. Mm -hmm. Well, I um, yeah. I think we're getting close to our time. So, um, Julie, I want to, 
Um, there was a quote from your book that I really loved um, that I think would be a good one to end on, but we can talk about it a little if we want. Um, you said, underlying every fight, argument, silent treatment, and passive aggressive mm -hmm. passive aggressive comment and attack is an unmet attachment need. And what a wonderful mm -hmm. way, what a wonderful thing to keep in our mind when I, we have a partner who's doing literally anything that triggers us or upsets us mm -hmm. to remember that they're not somebody who's out to get our goat, but rather somebody who has a need mm -hmm. that they might not know how to express. How beautiful. I, I just wanted mm -hmm. to yeah. say thank you. Yeah. I know that your book is just jam packed full of other quotes like that, that would make somebody go, oh my gosh, this person is on my team. They just don't know how to, how to show up that way. You know, right. we're just not seeing it. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much again for doing this and sharing all this with us. You're very, yeah. very welcome. Anybody who's interested, again, um, we, this is Julie Manano, uh, and her book is Secure Love, Create a Relationship That Lasts a Lifetime. Um, and you can find yes, it yes. probably literally anywhere that you buy books. Um, Jimmy, maybe you yeah. may be able to throw a link to it on this episode. Yeah, for sure. So that would be good too. And Julie, tell tell anywhere else, anyone else where you want them to find you, um, your website or just your Instagram? Uh, you know, my Instagram, I, I do have a website, thesecurerelationship.com. There are mm -hmm. tons of resources, you know, podcasts I've done. Um, I do have a clinic that, you know, I run for people looking for this type of work. Mm -hmm. I have a group of therapists working for me uh, that are right in line with what we're talking about today. Um, yeah, just lots of resources there. Any, anything I have to offer, you can find on my website. Mm -hmm. um, but my Instagram account was sort of like the flagship, you know, that's where all this started. <laughs> so there's so yeah. much. I mean, honest, to be honest with you, nothing in the book is not on that Instagram account. It's just in a much book. The book made it really user friendly and organized and much more yeah. easy. You know, the, the posts I put up are all kind of disjointed and right. Um, so, but, but if you, you know, can't afford the book or can't afford therapy, like, please go to the Instagram account. It's all free. It's all yeah. there. And thank you from the bottom of every, every one of our hearts for offering that kind of information for free to the world. That's amazing, Julie. It's, you've really, you've yes, really changed, you. changed the internet for the better by creating that account. Well, I really appreciate that and i think that the likewise for you guys oh, so yeah thank you so much 